How's that? Everything looking good? <laughs> All right, so a little EMI to start your hour off. Absolutely. Let's get us going here. Um, so I'm going to go through the presentation here. Everything's uh, available on the website to give away for free. But I've also got six copies of the report that I'm going to talk about the findings from. And here's the offer. I'm not giving them away for free. I'm giving them away in exchange for somebody who can make me an offer to do something different with the data, um, help me to do, do this again, or figure out something else. Um, if you've got a great book that you've done, or you know something else, a good t-shirt that you have. And barring all of those things, if you buy me a beer, I'll give you one. <laughs> I have six, so that's kind of the graded hierarchy of, of interest. And you know, I'm probably committing a faux pas here in terms of classroom management, but I'm going to just give this away so to give you something to distract your attention while I'm giving the presentation. So you can look through this. You can get it online, um, download the whole thing. It's a released under a Creative Commons license, so there's, um, see, I'll do one back here. Um, you can uh, do anything you want with it um, under, under those terms. Um, and I'm not going to really refer to it, but what I want to do is talk about the findings from the survey itself. You folks in the back one here. <laughs> so, my name is Roger. Um, I am from, I'm from Georgetown, and what I'm gonna do today is go through um, four things here, talk about what exactly this project is. Just as a show of hands here, how many, you obviously all read the descriptions you've seen, how many of you actually went onto the website to see what the report looks like? So good, a bunch of you, so you've probably seen it. So mostly what I'm trying to do is tell you things to aggregate the data and talk about the findings that we did from the report, so it's not so much, here's the report, and here's how to read it, so I'm trying to do a little bit more than that, but start out a little bit of what the project is and the purpose, why we put it together, talk about the process, how we collected all the data that goes into this, um, then the, the bulk of what I want to do is talk about the findings, and there's a two-page handout, I did 40 copies, I'm sorry if we ran out, I also posted it on the Cali website, the PDF that I put there that has summary <coughs> charts of all the things, it's kind of the aggregated data from everything, so that's there, so that's the findings, and then the future is talking about what to do next, and that's sort of this bargain for you know people who want the report to suggest ideas to do with it or figure out another way to, to, to do that. Um, so the project itself, it's a web design study of 203 law schools, and anybody who looks at numbers for law schools, that number is obviously higher than the number of ABA accredited law schools. Um, there's what, 187 or something like that? So what we did is we did all of the uh, ABA accredited law schools, all of the online law schools that I could find, and I did Cambridge and Oxford in there as well, just to add to sort of the English language speaking thing. And if anybody here is from Canada, I, I forgot Canada, so. <laughs> uh, that's my fault. Um, <laughs> I think so. Yeah, yeah, we've got good medicine up there. Um, so the, the, the purpose, and maybe it's obvious, but and the biggest reason that we did it is, or that I wanted to do it, is to look to see, well, what are other people doing? There's all these things, oh, everybody's doing this, everybody's doing that, these are the trends. Just come up with a way to document, analyze, and count what are people doing on their home pages. Um, and this is going to be relevant to people redesigning their websites. Uh, I got an email after I posted it up from people in Chicago saying, Oh, I wish we'd have had this when we were doing a redesign. Their, their site went live today if you want to check it out. So the one that's in the book is now um, out of print, so to speak, because their new site went live today. Um, University of Chicago Law School. Um, it's a pretty nice looking site. Um, and also for feature editions, it's going to be relevant. So you've got a well-established site. You've already done the redesign, but you want to add one more thing. You know, Somebody comes to you and says, We've got to have a Twitter logo on our homepage. We've got to have this, that, and the other thing. Well, this gives you an idea of just paging through, like how are people implementing these things? Um, and just benchmarking, like how does your site compare to others? And you know, just a reality check. This is kind of like everybody's doing Flash. Well, this is a reality check to show that no, not everybody is doing Flash. Um, so that's there. And as part of this, what I wanted to do, because I've never seen a study like this, and I wanted to try to get something that has some numbers behind it, is consider whether there are relevant and valid design metrics to count all of these things and, and put them together in a report 
try to compare things objectively so it's not like this is a great looking site, this is an ugly site. Try to do things where it's like set things side by side and they just sort of speak for themselves. And also just come up with a framework for how to do this in the future, whether it's then extending it to a different genus of, of pages or content within law schools or it'll be the 2010, 2011 report, that type of thing. And also I just wanted to make something that looks nice. I wanted to put this on my dean's <coughs> desk and say, Take a look. We at Georgetown, and this is another sort of background of why we did it, we're going into a redesign process. We've sent out an RFP to a bunch of companies, so we're going to do this redesign. So I want to say, well, this is the state of what's going on now. Put it on the Dean's desk, a really nice looking thing, and then give it all away. I mean, I, we spend a fair amount of time and money on doing this, so I just thought, well, let's do this and not try to sell it or not try to, you know, just keep it as this competitive internal thing. So that's the project. The process, just looking at this three slides. I'll tell you what it says down there. Um, and I'll try to put these on the um, Cali website because they're not there now. Um, the, the, so here's sort of a 10,000 foot view and I'll go into a little bit more detail on this. So we started from the ABA statistics. Um, initially I had gone to the ALS website. They have a pretty easy um, list of links to law school homepages. A few of them are different and stuff like that, but it's missing demographics and it's missing some important things where you know, you might say to somebody, well, they have this, but their tuition is X, but their law school, you know, their faculty is Y, that type of thing. So we wanted to get the ABA stats in there to have a little bit more demographic information about that. Added to that, of course, the stuff that wasn't in the spreadsheet, which are the non-ABA schools, the online things, the Oxford, Cambridge, etc. Then to find the collection scope, try to figure out what it is that we're trying to capture. What, it, what is it that we can put into a report that would be useful and, and, and um, you know, possible to do? without spending a ton of time on it. So we wanted to get the screen capture, just the picture of the home page. We wanted the color information and the source code. And the, the thing that cuts off at the bottom here, the way that um, we, we do this in terms of how to capture the data, we use a tool called browsershots.org to capture that information. I'll show in a second kind of how that works. Um, the color information for the site, often the site's sort of presence is portrayed by the colors that are shown up in the style sheet and other things like that. There's a Firefox plugin called Colorzilla. I'll show you briefly how that works. That's in there. And then some of the elements that we were looking at was a manual process of getting a copy of the source code of the home page and running a bunch of tests against it to see does it have Flash or JavaScript and things like that. So the screen capture um, process, um, there's a bunch of different tools out there. Um, uh, Adobe has a new one, Browser Labs, which is pretty neat. But um, what we use is Browser Shots. So you can do up to like 30 or 40 different browser versions, this is a really good tool to use. You've designed a site, you want to see how does it look in, in a different operating system, in a different browser, that type of thing. We focused on um, 1024 pixel width, it's a pretty common one that gets a fairly wide display range, and we got seven browsers across three operating systems. Again, the, the thought was, let's get a good representation of everything, so not show sites that look bad in Firefox or that, that look bad in Internet Explorer 6, but capture a broad range of them so we could then also go back and see, you know, how does this all compare. The nice thing about Browser Shots is it returns to you a zip file that has embedded in the information the date that it was captured, the browser version, and the operating system, so that what we did is that we parsed all of that stuff and poured it into there, and then below most of the screenshots that are in the report, it'll, it'll, release, it'll, it'll include that data that was captured directly through this process. The color information, uh, what we did is we got this from Colorzilla, it's this plugin. So I'm at Georgetown, so for instance, if you had it installed in your Firefox browser, um, then what you do is um, you go there, it cuts off at the bottom here, but the, you do this analysis and it, it looks at the document object model. It's basically every color iteration on a page that is not in Flash, that is not in um, images. Um, so it looks through that, primarily at your style sheet and a few other things, and it builds that information. It creates then um, the opportunity to make a permalink for that, and then what that does is that sets up this array of colors. So for every website that's in the first section of this report, we have this nice array of colors, so that's gonna reflect the number of colors that are available, but not necessarily used in the home page for things. Some are as few as four, and some are as many as like 40. So that's some interesting information there. And then once that's done, we use that to then um, use the stuff that we put into the database to generate the nice little charts um, for that information there. So again, just finalizing the process side of things here, 
what we did is, again, the goal was to print a report and, and we wanted one school, one page. We've got 200 schools to deal with here. If it spans across multiple pages, it's not a very usable product. So we crammed a lot of stuff in there. It's a pretty small typeface, but, but it is what it is. So we put it all into the database, um, capturing it in a variety of different ways, some parallel, some sequential in terms of the data. Put it into Microsoft Word and then used a lot of tools to, um, to, to um, modify that and then put a PDF up on the web. There's a browsable version. You can download it on the web. Eventually, I'll put up a version you can buy through like Google or something like that. But the, the focus is really just on this, this fixed printed report. Um, this is a screenshot of the, of the report. It's a page abstraction of things here. Um, and so th this is how uh, we put the information there. I'll just kind of describe how you can see it. It's in the report as well. So number one there, um, what we have is the information that was done by hand coding or human analysis. So that's going to be the page title, the type, whether it was a CSS driven site or an HTML you know, driven site or, or you know, generated site. Um, then we have in four different places the demographic information from the ABA data. We actually ended up using a lot of that stuff in there, but um, I think it's really useful because people might look at the tuition cost or you know the library size, the number of librarians that may or may not have some import in terms of the design. The thing that falls off the bottom here is that right here we have the um, U.S. News ranking from the last four years. Rankings are what they are, but people seem to want to see them even if nobody admits to really you know liking them or the analysis. <laughs> And then down here that, that we're missing, but you can see in the printed report, is we ran a test of uh, seven different things looking for types of information in the source code. So we're looking to see, does it have Flash, does it have CSS, that kind of stuff. And there's a little image that showed up in the report to reflect that. And the main focus, of course, was getting a screenshot. So half of the page of each printed thing is a screenshot. And to the extent that it was captured correctly in the database, it's got the information of which browser it was from and the date that it was captured below that. Um, so again, this is human assisted analysis and entry. There is some room for judgment uh, on a couple of these things, but mostly we try to be as objective as possible to put it in there. And um, again, the focus is trying to get a good representation of every school there, not to try to you know call people on, hey, look at this, you know, you didn't you know that it looks bad in ID6 or something like that, um, which some do, but um, some don't. Uh, and then in my presentation now for what follows, we're talking about these findings. To the extent that any of this is criticism, it's really meant to be constructive. So if I'm saying something bad about a site, it's not meant to say the school is bad or the one person that did it is bad. I'm just trying to like come up with these things. So let's look at the findings here. Um, we talk about width, design type, search, RSS, favorite site times, Flash, and JavaScript. So these are all um, in um, different versions of the charts or in the handout that's there. And this information is in the, um, in the report. So page width. When you design the width of a page, you've got four options of how to do that. You can do it by pixels, you can do it by percentages, you can do full width, which is just poor content, let it stretch out as far as that widescreen moni monitor of yours can, can support, or you can do M's, because this shows up at the bottom here. This number 187 here, these are all pixel-based sites. Um, I really thought in going into this that more people would use a variable width um, measurement, but I mean, 187 of the sites use pixels. What it turns out to be is that pixels are the most easy to control. If you come from a design world, especially if you're print oriented, you want something to look good across multiple iterations and multiple platforms. So it's no surprise in that sense that pixels are kind of the dominant, in fact, almost the only um, measurement that people are using for sites. Um, if you kind of look in, I'm, I've been sort of a fan of, of using M's, which is a proportional thing, or percentages, which is also a proportional thing. Um, but there's a, I'd seen a post recently from Cameron Mall, who's a designer, and he basically said he's going back to pixels. One advantage to pixels beyond like the design specificity that you get is that with all of the modern browsers, they don't really do text scaling the way that they used to with IE6. It's pretty much page zoom is what you're defaulting to. So again, there's a real, reason that um, pixels would be used for that. So then the question becomes, you're going to use pixels, so how wide are you going to do it? You know, this is a screenshot here. It doesn't matter where the data, what sort of the data is from, but this is showing a year's worth of visitors to the Georgetown Law Library homepage, um, actually the whole site, using uh, Google Analytics. This tiny little slice right here is 800 by 600. A long time there's been kind of this sort of mantra of 
you know, 800 by 600 is the target um, resolution that you want to have for websites because that's what the really small monitors were back when we had those, you know, 15 inch CRTs and stuff. And like, see some hands shaking, like 800 by 600, you can't go beyond that. I mean, one argument would be, well, of course you can go beyond that because you're really only a tiny fraction of your audience is going to have that. And so going into this report, I was like, well, which is it? Like, what? I mean, shouldn't it be a lot bigger? Shouldn't people be doing a lot more? And I mean, I'm sort of stealing the thunder with passing the, the figures out there, but it turns out that no, actually, 800 by 600 is fairly common. It is fair. I mean, it's script crept up a little bit. If you add up all of the ones that measure them in pixels and you average them, you get you get 850 pixels. So there really is not this this breadth of things there. Yeah, go ahead. We might cover this later, but I was just wondering, did you look at whether or not how many websites uh, supported smartphones and iPhones back days? I tried to, but I'll, I'll talk about that in the future. It, it was something that I had a hard time counting. Yeah. Um, but, but the interesting thing is, in terms of how to, how to do that, you can implement it with a style sheet specifically targeted towards a smartphone, or you could have a flexible design that would be percentage-based, that as your browser width creeps down, Basically, your, your page design creeps down that will support kind of these you know different you know, views of things. Um, but yeah, and if there, I'll talk at the end about why specifically targeting mobile phones is a little tricky in yeah. counting. Um, so that's that's how it, it graphs out in terms of the overall width of everything, just kind of plotting the top to the bottom. So the the highest one is over a thousand. Nothing's over um, 1,050. So the 1024 width, if that's really what you were targeting, you could still get every website surveyed in this this report into that metric, um, and then it scales down from there. The most common page width then, so that's the average, then what I wanted to look at to see is, is there some sort of theme or is there some kind of recurring thing that comes up here? This chart shows every width in pixels where there's at least two sites that um, are using that. So in terms of the 800 by 600 sort of idea, we still got a dozen of them that use that, that really do target that particular, at least width, I didn't measure height, because that's a little bit trickier to sort of get your head around, but there's 760 um, width, so there's 27 sites that use 760 width, and I think that's probably, and I'll show, I'll just cycle through this here, so the, here's about a dozen sites um, that are all center justified that use the 760 pixel width. Initially, when I saw that number jump out, I was like, oh, of course, that's everybody using the particular template, or everybody's using a particular design approach, or a particular sort of, you know, tool to implement their sites, and that really is not the case. There is a really a lot of flexibility and um, variation in terms of the sites that are using that. I mean, that's sort of 800 with a little bit of breathing room for your eye to sort of appreciate that information on the side. So 760 is the most frequently one. There's, a, there's almost 30 sites that are using that. And I just did the ones that are sort of center justified so you can cycle through them and kind of see how they all compare. You can see there's a, there's a big variety and a big um, difference in approach to doing this stuff. The next thing is there's 14 sites that here that use full width. Um, the trick to, I'm a really big fan of full width, the trick to it is that it can look funny. You get problems with white space and you get problems with long line length if you don't do some complicated things to, to um, address the um, way that the site works. So Penlaw is a really nice looking site. They are one of the 14 in the study that does a full width. You get lots of white space over here, and this is just something you have to deal with. Either you're comfortable with you know, pouring things out to the really wide monitors, or from a design perspective, you cringe at the fact that you have to deal with all these like floating content elements. So that's a thing that you have to sort of come to terms with in um, implementing it that way. Looking at an interior page from the pen site here, um, this is what you get. Is you get this really nice, you know, really long line length, which can be really hard to read if you're delivering content to people that you want them to read. That's not just you know bullet points or sort of you know, short stuff. That's the difficulty with that. Um, so that's that's all I really have to say about width. The next thing we looked at um, was how people are designing their sites. Um, you know, best practice uh, is to separate content from presentation. And the easiest way to do that is to use CSS or cascading style sheets. How many of you don't know what CSS is? Anybody? People know, good. So you, to, is to use cascading style sheets to, to do the presentation and to use HTML or you know XHTML or variations of that for the content. Um, and so going into it, I, I thought, well, there's probably not that many people that have sort of this advanced approach, or it is advanced or whatever. 
what we've got actually that cuts off here is 38 to 38 in terms of split for pure CSS um, uh, design versus pure HTML where you're using tables for HTML to implement it. And then bridging the gap here for this extra 24%, you've got things that have a hybrid where it's primarily using the um, style sheets to do the, the rendering, but use at least one or more tables in there to make things line up in a nice fashion. So that's what's there. Um, in addition to that, there's 196 of the schools, so almost all of them use some kind of style to do things like define the typography or the colors or things like that on their website. But on the flip side of that, 122 schools have at least one HTML table on their home page. So you know, there is some trends towards doing more CSS, but it's not everybody that's doing it that way. So let's take a look at, oh, and, and I have a little joke for you. Um, why would you not want to play poker at a CSS designer's website or her house? There's no tables there. <laughs> <laughs> so HTML layout, layout, you've got tables here, right? So this is the Brooklyn Law School site. Their site is designed with tables. And the way that it works, probably all know this, but this is showing both how we counted it and also kind of the implication of what it is. Tables are really easy to define in a fixed format, but they're really tricky to do any advanced things with and to change. Um, so this is all of these little highlights there. I don't know how well they show up. We've got the blue boxes and the you know, green and the red. So these are multiple nested tables that are on the Brooklyn Law School website. It works for them to display this nice grid. You've got these nine boxes of content in the middle that, that are sort of rotating pictures and highlight different content as you're going into it. Um, but, but this is the HTML layout and that they've got, that they're using HTML tables to do the layout of their site. So in defining the hybrid layout for the sites that, that have that on there, if you look at the Stanford Law School website, they have a very interesting and a very stark approach to what, the way that they design their site, a lot of navigational things and a lot of different approach to doing things. They also have one HTML table. I don't know if it shows up here, but we've got, they, they've got a table here to frame the particular highlight thing. So in terms of how it's counted in the report, this is a hybrid site. So some advantages to CSS, this may be obvious to people, but I think it's really useful to um, to look at here, I'm glad Ken Hurst just left, so now I'm going to deconstruct his <laughs> website. Um, so once you've designed a site, of course the next thing you might want to do is redesign, or, or redefine, or, or move stuff around. A great thing about CSS, of course, is that you can take all your content, you've defined it, you know, you've got this in the left, this in the middle, this in the right, and then just with a couple of shifts to the underlying code, without changing anything in terms of the way that the HTML is generated, you can move things around. So Here's the Duke site. If I wanted to redesign their site, what I could do, and I'll just cycle through these, and these are just single line of code that I'm changing in their style sheet, I could then say, you know, those video things, they just don't work in the left. I kind of want them in the center. And I say, well, you know, your eye tracks left to the right, and then it gets to the center, and then well, it's, it's getting lost on the right-hand side. So then I can shift this around, and I, I want to put the video content on the right, and navigation on the left, and I get news in the center. Well, then I get this evil white space on, you know, below the... Um, the navigation section there, and so what I can do is shift it all over, and these are all just single changes to, to the CSS that underlies it, and uh, I can move those over, do that, and then I can expand out that new section in the middle there, and then of course what I want to do is um, line up all my left navigation so it's all nice and left justified. Now that I've done all this, and now I'm really going to, not only would I make Ken mad, I'm going to make all the photographers and like the graphic design people at Duke mad and say, you know what, let's get rid of this gorgeous pictures at the top and let's make it so people see the content right at the top. This is just a single line change in the site and it presents it that way. And then of course I really want to make everybody mad and I decide that Comic Sans is the, is the right <laughs> Single line of code, I mean, and it, that's a real advantage to doing it. So once you've designed a site, you're not set or you're not fixed in terms of how you put things or where you put things in the site. Another real quick advantage to CSS sites is that they're really great for optimizing your site for search engines and they're really great for presenting information for people who can't see pictures, as in blind people or visually disabled people. This is what the New York Law School site looks like in the web browser. If you turn off CSS, this is what the New York Law School site looks like. Um, it's completely divorcing the presentation from the structure of the site and then structurally you've set it up so you've got hierarchical menus and very clear approach to the way to get to the content. If you know CSS, this is sort of like you know, preaching to the choir or, or um, you know, just telling you stuff you might already know. Last advantage to doing it um, is that this is the Vermont Law School website. 
Then if you want to print the page out from the Vermont Law School website, them being a environmentally friendly school, it's nice that what they do is make it that you're not wasting a lot of paper and wasting a lot of toner ink and printing it out. You get rid of the navigation stuff at the top, you get rid of things on the right, you can reorient things, make it so some doesn't print or some does print, you can get a really nice, gorgeous, high resolution logo at the top of the site and things like that. So that's a great thing you can do with CSS. The next thing we look at, and if there's questions as we go along, and stop me, um, um, in the process of things. The next thing that we looked at here is uh, with site search. Um, so we wanted to look to see is there a site search option on um, the website? Sorry for the feedback here. Uh, and then if there is, what search engine are people using? So uh, I was surprised in a sense, but also not surprised to find that, that 17 sites included in the study have no ability to search anything. It doesn't even recognize, it just, there's no link, there's no search box, nothing like that. So 17 of the designs that were implemented, they were, the decision was, or the lack of decision was, don't put any search out there. 23 of them have just a link, so you click to it and then use the extra step of like going some other de destination and um, submitting the information there. And then this is how it all rounds out for the rest of it. Google, not surprisingly, is the predominant winner in a sense of, of the search um, decision for websites. I'll talk about what the different Google versions are, because you don't know. Google Custom Search, there's 47. Syndicated Search, 36. Search Appliance, that's the hardware that Google sells, um, that you can run in your own server room, 37. The one thing that I sort of cheated on her a little, but I or didn't investigate enough, is this Custom Search thing with these 42. That basically means I couldn't tell in looking at a site. I couldn't, be ob I couldn't obviously know the, which particular implementation it was. If you have an in-house developed thing, and then when your results are displayed, it's not like powered by HTDIG or something like that. Well, then I don't know what it is, so that's how it shows up there. But all of the, the major ones that are there do have a search option on their home page. So in terms of site search, you know, Google obviously is, is the leader in looking at those metrics. Um, Google syndicated search. It is the oldest version of, of a hosted search option that you can have through Google. Back in the day, it used to be, essentially, this is like going to Google and limiting it to a particular link, um, on, you know, a particular domain on their website. Um, it's the older version of it, and I'm, I'm a little surprised that since it is free and Google Custom Search is free, that a lot more people haven't moved to Custom Search. Maybe it's just a legacy thing or people haven't thought about it. Um, so that's syndicated search, I'll show an example of that. Um, custom Search, you can have a multiple um, domain search, and you have a little bit more targeted information on it. And the great thing about custom search is you can set it up so it can appear in any domain, so it can show up on your own homepage um, or your own website. And then Search Appliance has all the options that the custom search does, but then that is something that's hardware that you configure and you administer, so you have a little bit more flexibility of, of how to index things and, and how to present it there. So just to show a couple of examples, I wanted to get a lot of screenshots of, of websites from the study into this and talking about the data. Google syndicated search, so Creighton has syndicated search, they have a search box at the top, you run a search, you get the results, and then your customization or, and things like that that you get is, you typically can have a banner at the top of the, uh, the results page of a website. So it gets, you can see that it's coming from Creighton, you get some links back to their content and things like that. The problem with syndicated search in terms of maximizing the information that's there for people searching it is that the URLs that get um, returned are on the Google's homepage. So that's not going to be counted in your web stats and it's also you know, not going to be obvious to people or, or is comforting to people that it's still staying and be quote unquote in your domain. <coughs> the Google custom search implementation, um, this is the DePaul website. So if I was looking for admissions information on their site, you run a search and then you get back results that you feel a lot more comfortable with in terms of the framing of the results. It's on a Duke Law, or a DePaul website and it has things there. It has contextual search in the middle. It says powered by Google, but you've also got all of your navigational elements there. The other nice thing in terms of sort of user convenience and design sort of um, uniformity is that you're going to keep maintain your favorites icon because it's on the DePaul website, and also you can capture that information using Google Analytics so you can see how are people searching, when are people searching, and what are people searching, things like that. Um, not every Google custom search is implemented in the same way. Sometimes what people do is they do the same custom search implementation and they have the results page look something like this. 
this is the Harvard Law School website, they have a gorgeous website, they either intentionally or unintentionally have decided that the results page is going to be displayed simply at um, the Google website. And so you get there and maybe, maybe the thought is, well, you know, we're all inclusive and you get here and well, maybe you wanted something else and you just you know, check a different box and you go off to Google or maybe the thought was, was an oversight or something. So one thing to think about in implementing if that's one thing. Um, and Meg, don't tell John. <laughs> Great. Uh, at the back of the report, I don't really have anything to say about this, but at the back of the report, what I wanted to do is show for sort of design focused people different approaches that people have for doing the search boxes in their website. I'm not going to really comment on this other than just briefly kind of mentioning how we decided to do it. And, and the things that are in the back, so the report is all of this data that's about every law school, and in the back is representative information for certain types of things that you might put on your website. So these are not all the search boxes that people use on their home pages, but it does show you that there is a real variety of ways that people can implement things. And it looks a little bit in print to see kind of the different approaches to multiple destination searching, targeted searching, you know, <coughs> contextual help and things like that, or just simply stylized buttons that really look good with the presentation of the website. So RSS news feeds. One other thing, the next thing that we looked at on all the websites is uh, the instance of feeds on people's home pages. And this is the one that really surprised me the most because this is really easy to do. Um, there's only 24 schools, so just over 10% in the study, that have news feeds that computers can recognize. So if you have a blog or you're, you're, you're syndicating your content through like current news about your faculty or other variety of mechanisms, you probably have a feed of some sort that you're pushing things out to people. And you might think, well, what's the big deal? People can see the link and things like that. But it really is a user convenience to do it. So if you're in Internet Explorer 7 or higher, or you're in Firefox and you like 2 or higher, if you have something that computers can recognize that particular RSS feed, it's automatically going to show up and then the little icon shows orange and it says subscribe to this page. Also, if you use a feed reader like Google Reader or something like that, all you can do is you can copy in the URL. So this is the University of Minnesota. So law at umn.edu, just drop it into my Google News Reader. It goes to the page and says, oh, I know where this is. I can recognize it. Of course, if I was at um, UTK's University of Maybe I said that wrong. But um, whereas if I have one that isn't recognized that way, it is just going to come back and say, I don't know, there's no search, there's no feed index. Um, and I'm guessing this last bit of code that I'm going to put up here doesn't show up there yet, does it? The code to do this is it's one line of code that goes in the header of your document. Um, it's real simple to do, and this is really the only code that I show there. And, and actually, because of the titles, I don't even show it there. But it's real simple to do. It's just to, you relate it back to it and you say, you know, alternate source of information, RSS slash XML, and you put it in there. Um, it's a small thing, but I'm, I'm surprised 24 of the schools surveyed it in here did it, and then all the others didn't. Um, so that's the approach to doing it where computers can see it. We also wanted to capture, so what are people doing in terms of humans seeing it? So um, a lot of them, unsurprisingly, and, and you know, sort of thankfully, are using commonly recognized icons for RSS or for XML or things like that, and then they show up there. Some choose to make it so that they fit with kind of the typography of their site. Some inexplicably, this Georgetown school decides that blue is better. That's blue is the theme of our site, so we don't want to do the orange RSS thing. I guess that gives not the, I don't know, orange school. Um, <laughs> So that's there, and then this other one, this may or may not show up, it doesn't show up. University of New Mexico, I was very excited about this, and, and the coder in the US, it's not nice the other. They also include uh, icons to show that their, what, their site is W3C XHTML 1.0 compliant and CSS compliant, and they have a little icon for downloading the Google Reader. So clearly their designers did this and not the publication people can say that's, that's um, the way that they're on their own. I think it looks nice. It works well with the design of their site. Uh, the next thing we looked at was favorites icons, um, favicons, and I think this is the most important tiny graphic on your website. I mean, maybe it's the only tiny graphic on your website, but it really is in terms of maintaining brand recognition and sort of, you know, uh, how your site appears um, online. It's really the most important thing. It's real tiny and it's real, uh, you know, relatively easy to implement, and it's easy, also easy to forget. So this is the um, 
location bar in Firefox. So Ave Maria, they have sort of an ecclesiastical sort of looking icon there that they've got next to it. Um, and then here, as I was going through the study, I noticed, you know, I, I was looking at all of these schools trying to count things, and it lines up that Baylor, Boston College, Boston University, and BYU all have different approaches to doing their favorites icons. Um, but then Buffalo and California Western, at least in terms of how they're recognized in IE7 in this franchise, they don't do one, so it defaults to the, um, to the uh, Internet Explorer icon. Is that a big thing? No, not really. But again, it's a, it's a nice thing to think about in terms of implementing your site. It's one little thing that you can do in terms of putting this together. The other place that they're going to show up is this is a list of your, your favorites or bookmarks icons in Fire or Internet Explorer, similarly there in Firefox as well. So um, that's the thing that's in the printed report, and I'll just sort of show here briefly, is that there's, a, there's differing ways that people choose to implement their favorites icons. A, lot of, a common approach is just to use letters. So you've got a recognizable brand, or your Northwestern and the N shows up on a lot of things, or you know the Drake one is stylized, but I think it's a really effective way to do the D and try to do that so that it ties in with um, the sort of recognition and designing your site. So uh, one approach is to do letters and initials. Um, these are, again, are all in the printed report there. Another thing is if you've got a shield or an insignia or things like that, you can do um, a version of that. Um, on your website. When I worked at George Mason for a while, probably for about an hour, my director and I tried to decide if we should just invent a shield. <laughs> just because it would look good as a favorite site. Huh? And then we decided not to. Uh, and then we did GMU Law. We did initials for a while, and I think I've left there and somebody else took over the site. And I think they're doing a little like um, door column kind of you know, thing. So yeah, we didn't invent it. But like Yale, I mean, you know, when, when um, John Palfrey did the, you know, what would Yale do? Immediately you can see, like, that's the Yale shield. You recognize it. It's tiny here. It's, it's scaled down, but you recognize it. It's a good brand identifier. Another approach is to do something if you don't have that crest and you don't have recognizable icons or a short number of letters, is you just do something that's a little bit more aspirational or, or just design oriented. Um, like, you know, Albany has a building. UT Austin is down here. This is, um, you know, this is um, the Tarleton building. to the UVA one that's in here is that, again, if you don't think about it, you might be using a system that has a particular embedded favorites icon. This is from the particular content management system that they have. If you go to their site now, they've changed it, but I left it in the report. Not really to thumb my nose at UVA, but just to show that, like, to think about these things, there's, there's a variety of sort of ways that you can do it, and you end up often inheriting decisions that you didn't make intentionally, um, but you can go back and change them over time. It's really easy to and that's the favorites like um, So the next thing um, we looked at was the instance of Google Analytics. Um, Google Analytics, of course, probably most people know here, is it's a free way to count traffic visitors to your website. Uh, and it requires JavaScript. Um, so what we did, and then there's a particular type of JavaScript that's really easy to count. So of all of the schools that are in the report, 60% have Google Analytics code on their homepage, and 40% don't have it on their homepage. Um, the thing to note, though, is um, that not all of the schools that use it use it for the entire website. Penn Law, I know, and Georgetown Law as well, um, you know, from first-hand experience, we just use it on the home page. So all we really do that for is to look to see who's visiting our site with Mac, with Mac operating system, or you know, particular browser width, or things like that. So we're not using it in that sense to actually measure traffic to the entire site or track things sort of on a holistic way, but it's just sort of a, you know, <laughs> check to see people come to the home page, who's coming here and when and things like that. Um, so I don't really have anything else to say about that, but 60-40 split. But the 40% there could be people using web trends or other log analysis tools, so they could be counting stuff that way. Um, and then the one quirk to Google Analytics is that it requires JavaScript, so you, you're not counting people who don't have JavaScript turned on who are visiting your site, so that's a little tricky. And the other thing is that without a lot of programming finesse, you are not going to be counting PDF downloads and document downloads other than hits to generated HTML or HTML equivalent pages. Um, but, but again, 60-40 is the split on that. So it does require JavaScript to do that. Um, the next thing we wanted to look at here is look to see which sites actually have some form of JavaScript in there. 
it's not down here, but your math's probably pretty good. 94% <laughs> have it, and 6% don't. This doesn't recognize, the thing that I wanted to do was, was to look to see, you know, which frameworks are people using, which particular implementations are people using, and things like that, but this was the easiest thing to count, like, who's using it? And then, you know, then we'll look in a second about kind of the different ways you can use it, but almost everybody is using it. Intuitively, I think almost all web browsers have, or people browsing the web, not the actual software, have JavaScript turned on, but I, we only use Google Analytics, so we can't count the non-existence of JavaScript, um, so that's there. So let's look at a couple of examples of JavaScript that we're going to flash in terms of the types of content that you could display on your website. So this is the Colorado Law website, and what they use JavaScript for is there's a rotating photograph that's in the center of the page that every couple of seconds it rotates it, you get a different thing there, and it's very integrated in terms of design. In terms of in deciding how to use JavaScript, I think it's always useful to turn it off and then look to see if people still use your site. You don't know how many people don't have it turned on, but if you have a browser, like a handheld or something like that that doesn't recognize it, you want to look to see how it works without the JavaScript turned on. So without JavaScript turned on, you miss that entire picture in the middle, which you might think, wow, oh, that's really losing a lot. The photographers and the graphic designers and things like that are gonna think, yeah, you are losing a lot. The nice thing about this implementation, though, is that the rollover menus that are on the site, they still work with JavaScript. I mean, it may require modern versions of particular browsers that recognize the CSS rules for that, but it still works. So that's the thing to consider. If it's not required content, maybe it's okay that it doesn't show up you know, completely when you do that. Another example of JavaScript stuff that you could do, this is Cleveland Marshall. Um, it's, it's a little tricky to see. I tried to fake this out with different screenshots, but what they have is they have a rotating series of, it's like a slideshow gallery here, of the little thumbnail of the image that shows up there, and you can slide back and forth, all implemented with JavaScript, the way that it shows up there. You can do a variety of things that way. In a second, we'll get here, and then that would be it. If you turned it off, all that stuff goes away. You still have the primary content of the site here. You still got the news, the welcome, the information, the navigational menu. You do lose the stuff on the lower left-hand side of things there. So, you know, that's, that's an interesting thing. But again, it's just something to consider as you're implementing it. So let's look at Flash. Flash is sort of another alternative of how you could, you know, enter, um, you could introduce or, or portray um, dynamic content on your website. This actually surprised me. I thought that there may have been more Flash sites out there. And this is one of those reality check things that I was interested in doing the study for, is look to see, is everybody doing Flash? Well, about a third of the people, 36% of the people are doing Flash, um, and then 64% are not doing Flash. So let's look real briefly at the types of things you can do for Flash. A number of them really don't require Flash, but it's a really easy and gorgeous way to implement something. So you have you know, a rotating image, or you have a rotating photo that kind of fades from one to the next, or things like that. Um, Georgetown, uh, on our site, we have Flash on our home page, but it's just a randomly loaded graphic. It doesn't even link anywhere, but it's a, you know, it, it, it does provide gorgeous typography and it puts things there on the home page. So that, you know, one sort of fairly common thing is in terms of the school doing it, rotating image are fairly um, similar in terms of the other thing is sort of a profile navigator or a slideshow technology. Um, there's examples of different slideshow implementations in the second section of the report. So this is an example from Stetson. This sort of page through different screenshots of it here. So you've got it that you, um, as you hover over each element, you can get kind of a different view of those particular things. Um, and that's how that's implemented there. And with both of those, I didn't do the screenshots. If you turn flash off, the way that the, the one, all of the ones that I checked, there's just an empty box. You can have alternatives to, to present that information and things, um, but that's how it's set up. So those are the first three sections, but now I want your input. And questions, feedbacks, criticisms, all that other stuff. Let's look at the um, look at the future. I'll come up with some suggestions to talk about, and then I really want to hear back from you. One thing I want to show this to different people as well, this is great. Why don't you do, instead of just sort of being objective, why don't you be very subjective and try to rank these things, give things different values? give things different things to come up with sort of points for how you would do stuff. Um, maybe you come up with, you know, the level of validation that a site has, they get a particular number of points. You come up with, you know, if they use CSS for design versus HTML tables, you can sort of, you know, rank them that way. That's one idea. 
Um, another idea is, is to use this as a sort of a platform for coming up with web best practices, like you know what are some common types of things that you should do, like using no, no script alternatives or using CSS only for design. Some of those are that's kind of the low hanging fruit. So there certainly, if as you delve into this more, could be um, other kind of best practices out there. The thing that I didn't talk about at all is color palette. Like what could be said about like what is an effective use of a color palette? A limited number of things in a particular hue, and then one color opposite that on the color spectrum is a really, I think, a really good way to implement things. I don't know color design theory enough to say much about it, but that could be something that, that's done beyond that. Um, the other thing that could be done here, another thing that people have suggested is, well, this is great. Well, we, what, we, what would be helpful there is to know when was the date of that site's last redesign? Who's responsible for that content? So if I really like something, I can email them. Um, what CMS are they using? What programming language are they using? Those are all really great suggestions. I think they're really valuable. They all require essentially a human to go to each one of those and figure them out or to have a sort of a community sourced system of contributing to information. I think that would be really valuable to have in a system, but it's really difficult to do that in any kind of an automated way. Um, the other code level analysis, and this, this drops out, that we could do is look to see, since so we've got the source code for all these things, we could run another test of all this stuff, like look to see what document type are people using. Are people really going for XHTML? Are they going for I mean, which, which document type are they using? How many people, and this goes to your question, how many people are doing print style sheets versus PDA style sheets, things like that? That's really tough to count because of the way that you could implement CSS. You can have import rules, you can have one for media all, and have subsections of things that don't show up on the home page. But that would, I think, be really useful to know who's really doing that approach to, to target this information. Um, and again, you could report out into it, not necessarily in a ranking fashion, but look to see you know, how are sites validating to look to see, you know, beyond do they look pretty, but are they correct in terms of their technical implementation? JavaScript library are they using? Flash version requirements, things like that. And then um, the other thing that, that we'll, we'll probably do internally, but I'd, I'd love to sort of consider uh, externally is to use this as a framework for analyzing other things. This is just the home page. So this is all, all this talk and all this in, in investigation and, and report there is really just the home page. How many of you go regularly to your law school's home page? That's more than I would have thought. How many of you think your students regularly go to your law school's home page? Yeah, so the question, like what other sort of genus of pages would have made sense to, to count and document and really get some analysis behind? Um, and in faculty profiles, that. And then also, this is print right now. Um, I intentionally did not put this online as a web-based application simply because I didn't know if I would want to, you know, update this next year, the year after, things like that. Um, today, University of Chicago's redesigned website launched, so that looks out of print. So, you know, I didn't want to sort of force it that I'd be updating that or come up with iterations and a version history and all that other stuff. Um, but that would be a useful you want to get back to it and say, I want to see all the top 10 schools, or all the schools in the Mid-Atlantic region, or all the schools with at least 100 faculty members to look at X, that type of thing. Those are my ideas about um, ways to take this beyond that, but I'd love to hear questions, feedback, criticisms, anything like that. We have 10 minutes. Yeah. I don't know that. Like, I do know that at um, Georgetown, we've sent out an RFP to seven design firms, I think, seven or eight. I'm actually kind of out of the nitty gritty part. But that's a good question. I don't know. I mean, some data to put in there might be design firm and local contact or something like that. And it'd be a great portfolio move for design firms. Yeah, in the back. It would also be interesting to find out how many of the designs and approaches to the web designs are law schools are coming from the university level, mm -hmm. like how much control the university is trying to put upon the individual yep. law schools or schools within the university. Yeah, yeah, that's something I thought about. I, just, I didn't figure out a way to put it on a single page and count it, but I think that, that that's important. Because, yeah, I mean, how much of it is forced on you and how much of it is, yeah. I like their stuff. Yeah. Roger, what might also be useful in well, the same way that you were saying that you also if anybody's doing not only just the website design, but also doing the branding at the same time, rebranding. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Other things? Ideas? I, I don't know how to measure this, but as I've always understood it, it would be 
content and not the look and feel. I mean, the look and feel is grabbing first, but mm -hmm. I'm more concerned right now, and our biggest problem is we don't have anybody editing our web pages. So we got a thousand pages with a full of crappy content right. for the most part. And so I'm sort of, I don't know how to measure the content, but it's a nice way to find out who's got web editors and who's got, who's got right. good content and how, do you, how are you doing that? We have a content management system. But we don't have anybody who's managing the actual content that ends up on the web page. Yeah. Who proofs it? Who makes sure that it's well written? And that's the human side of things that are really hard to sort of get your head around. Yeah. Because you could say like, who's using CMSs? Who's using contribute? Who's using front page or whatever? But even all of those things don't tell you who's actually actively updating things or who actually has distributed you know content. What do you all think? I mean, does it make sense? Is this an apples and oranges thing and it really doesn't make sense to count this information? Or or is it, I mean, is it eye-opening to see in charts and graphs and sort of design metrics really kind of what the state is going to be talking about? Yeah. I think it definitely makes sense to me. I'm the IT director at our law school and sure. we had a budget for redesigning our website mm -hmm. that about zero dollars. Okay. <laughs> 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 So, so one of my, from my background, one of my things is I was a PhD model and mm -hmm. and so on. And probably that person and so on. Right. I'm like, okay, I can do it. No, no problem. Mm -hmm. So the last year we spent uh, on our redesign and everything. We're getting ready to launch in a couple weeks, so that'll be old as well. And right. But the thing that I like seeing is your numbers around who's using Flash and who's using JavaScript. Mm -hmm. Because obviously, I'm going to use JavaScript and got my drop down menus and all that kind of thing. It's a combination of CSS, JavaScript, and all that. But the whole time I felt guilty. I'm like, okay, JavaScript, I'm using this a lot in here. That's a problem. I know better than that. Being an IT person and knowing security and I'm going to turn this off in my browser and this that together. But the number you're showing, maybe I shouldn't feel that bad about the JavaScript. I had some flash on there, I took it off. But that piece of it is very important. So that, that's, that's yeah. Maybe this was mentioned in I don't remember, but it would be also helpful to know um, how many people are outsourcing and mm -hmm. hiring, you know, big dollar professionals versus how many are um, sourcing. Yeah, because, um, you know, in our case, we have a new dean who was showing us all of these grand websites, <laughs> and, you know, I'm going for King or Jean. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't. You know, necessarily know that some of these are, you know, Well, Cindy, you should give a recording of this after Robbie just gave you a compliment on the site. So we have a real, we have an infrastructure built in Cold Fusion that we can do all of the pouring the data into it with web-based forms and a variety of pretty sophisticated things that are behind that. And we converted all of the hex values to RGB values, so we could do a thing where you're searching and sorting by color values and things like that, and then outputting it. But, but right now, in terms of what is available under that license, it's it's the report. But talk to me and, and we'll figure out if, if there is a way to do it in some other fashion. By all means, we, we've got a you know SQL database that has all the data in there. So if somebody has a good idea, you know, email me, talk to me, and then let's do it. Yeah, and maybe and maybe we'll get it together. We, we can host it on our side. We can put it somewhere else, something like that. But right now, what I'm giving what we're giving away is the reports, and I can just work on it if you want to. Um, but the data is for for you know for discussion. Yeah. 
be nice to see some information about like usability tests, like what the user thinks from it, what their perspective is. Mm -hmm. So from students, faculty, or staff, you know, and that may be something that has to be done um, by everyone. You know, we'd all have to run usability tests to find out, you know, what do they think. Right. So. If you go to a site, I don't know how many people have seen it, but if you go to edgestyle.net, mm -hmm. they're a really nice site that what they do is they post redesigned websites, so they'll have the new and the old side by side, and then they also have a variety of different galleries to that. And it's sort of a hot or not kind of approach to things. If you get there and decide what's your style, what isn't your style. So without me even doing anything like that, they've kind of got that infrastructure already, but it's, it's more broad-based in terms of graduate, undergraduate, professional, you know, career services, that kind of stuff. But yeah, I think that would, I mean, the, I mean, which doesn't speak to usability, that's more just visual appeal, but usability, I think, is Something, I mean, I, I think accessibility, like if we actually got to the side of, of doing some evaluative thing to look at scoring websites, that would be a really easy thing to score people on. If you have CSS, if you have a skip navigation or, or skip to navigation thing, if you have these other kinds of things that are there, there's different ways to implement it. It's a little tricky, but there are ways to, to count that information. I think you can infer it by saying you use CSS for the layout of your site, so those tend to be more ADA compliant, but that's not completely accurate. Uh, but that, I mean, that's another, that's another useful thing. Any other questions? Comments? Yeah. 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 Ye
for argument's sake, if we put something up there and had a lot of opportunity for people to contribute content to say when their last redesign was, when you know who their design shop was, how many of you would actually contribute the information to that infrastructure? So as, as we go into this, so there's there's copies of the report floating around. If you want to take one with you, just come give me a give me a sales pitch for doing so. And I appreciate you showing up. Thank you.